This is another video that didn't quite go according to plan. It turned to be more of a podcast than a video. Henrik Carlson is a writer and he writes the Substack Escaping Flatland and I've been very inspired by his writings and so I reached out to him to get a little bit more about his process, how he works and also how he uses software. In one of his pieces he talks about how he uses Obsidian and I wanted to get a little bit into that in this conversation. But it really was an afterthought. So I've edited a separate video, which is just an excerpt of the part on Obsidian, if you want to go and have a look at that. But this is really a much broader conversation. Henrik and I talk about living an intentional life, finding meaningful work, doing work that's interesting to you, contributing to the culture, how to spend your time wisely, talking about relationships, how writing can influence your relationships, him and his wife's relationship. It really is a very divergent conversation. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Henrik's work, I've added links to some of his best essays, well, in my opinion, in the description below. And I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at them. So they are, the ones that I've linked to are free, but you can also turn on paid subscriptions. I've never been the sort of person who turns on paid subscriptions on Substack because I didn't really understand the economic model. And I discussed this a little bit in the video with Henrik. But I think you'll see if you read some of his essays just how insightful his thoughts can be. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I have got this newfound, I don't know, it's a experiment, which is reaching out to people whose work I admire and basically trying to understand a little bit more of like how they think, not about like doing the work necessarily. I think, you know, the channel that I, that I, that I have is about personal knowledge management and writing and looks at applications like LogSeq, which is very similar to Obsidian. I believe you've used Obsidian. But I am thinking of transitioning more into like a writing space, like long term. It's always something which has been on the back of my mind. And I've just got hordes and hordes of like notes that I'm thinking about, like how, how to filter up into essays and, and potentially like a book. And, I, and I, I think I'm inspired by your writing and your approach and also just like the way that you think about the world, like a, a little bit of a story is that I don't subscribe to anyone's sub stack. So I think I might've mentioned this in the email, but a friend sent me your, sent me your sub stack and he was like, you have to subscribe. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't subscribe to anything. Like because for me, the economics don't make sense. Like, it's like, okay, cool. Like $7 a month. It's like a book every month. Like, why would I do that? And then, I don't know, I think I read the, the relationship series, the one with looking for Alice and then Dostoevsky as lover, and then relationships as co-evolutionary loops. And I was like, wow, okay, no, I'll, I'll pay for this. <laughs> and also just like to support creators on the internet. Cause I think th this is the sort of weird question, which I have is like, where were the spaces for the type of writing that you do before Substack? Was there any places that like would take people reviewing no. their interiority? The short answer is no. You know, that, I mean, that, that's, no, it was nothing, right? You can't do the type of writing I do without Substack, as far as I can tell. And, and it's just really useful. Like, and I mean, I frame it, like it, it is, like if you think about it as, sort of a subscription, like a consumer choice, like $7 a month is, is a lot. But I think the majority of the people who subscribe, think about it more as a sort of in a more productive way that you think like, I'm kind of think that this type of writing should exist. And I'm really grateful for that. And like, not necessarily for my sake, I just find it to be beautiful that there are a lot of people that are sort of with the way they choose to consume actively really sort of trying to foster sort of an ecosystem where the incentives are different than in traditional publishing, where it's like possible to do these more kind of long-term bets and, and more weird shit. Oh, yeah. 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 Because I mean, I'm imagining you don't have any aspirations to write for publications again, but you, you obviously had that life previously. Well, mm -hmm. I say obviously, because I've read some of the articles and I'm, I'm, I'm just picking up on a little bits of your story from like when you were, you say a poet and traveled the world with that other guy for like two years and, you know, were reading, doing readings and stuff. And then my understanding is that you went into software and then 
now came back to, to writing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, writing has always been in some sense, the through line and the thing that I've been pulled back to definitely since I was like 11, started before that, but like from, wow. let's say from, from 15, from when I was 15, it's like very clearly like a serious practice. Uh, so when I was 15, my, a friend of mine, he, he committed suicide and that was like, obviously a, a sort of traumatic experience. And then like the, what happened when that, like immediately the same day, I just started writing all the time, like to process that. And I didn't even thought, sort of think about that, but like then, like exactly on the day, like 10 years later, I guess I had been writing a lot, like for those 10 years that been become a career. And I just realized that it was like all of those first 10 years was just processing that trauma to some extent. And, and during that phase, the first 10 years between 15 and 25, I did kind of go into the traditional literary world and wrote the Swedish magazines and I edited a magazine and I, I did a lot of poetry readings and toured uh, doing that. So, so I was in that world. And then I guess around the time I met my wife, who has been a, like a very tremendous influence on me. I just, when I started talking to her, I just realized there was these, these layers to me, to the way I think that I was unable to uh, articulate in those spaces. Like not, not because like political bias or anything, it's just, it's the way I want to do things. It's like so idiosyncratic that it just wasn't possible to do in those spaces. So I just like made a very conscious decision, maybe at 24 or something to just stop completely. And, and I kept writing like in my note taking system and so on, but then it wasn't until Substack that I like made a public career of it again. Um. So, and, and I have since I started with Substack, I do get like a lot of requests for, to write for magazines and I've done a few, like I had one in Spectator and I, that did Wired and, you know, as, as nice as that is, I like, I mostly agree to that because it helps my parents understand what I'm doing. You know, <laughs> it seems prestigious, like it, for the, for them, that is cool. Like from my perspective, that's really almost nothing like. Wired, I like the editor, so it's nice working with her, but mostly working for magazines is just the pieces get cut watered down and, and like the response and the, uh, you get from the reader, which is not as interesting. And, and I just really don't like that creating space at all. So, so I've just, I'd rather be, you know, I, I'd, I'd probably make more money doing that, but I'd, I'd rather not. You know? Yeah. I, I like what you, I mean, this is one of the pieces that you wrote on the you were offered like $200,000 or something crazy for, for someone to write full time. And then mm -hmm. you went back to your wife and she was like, no, why would you do that? Because you, I think, I mean, I've got the notes here somewhere, but I think it was something about you value, like relationship, curiosity, and then like your children, like that, allowing that loop to like go back. But I mean, that's quite something to say no to that amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard. I, yeah. Yeah. I get. Yeah, it's, it's really, like, it's really, really weird, like, that what's happened around the blog that I've gotten a uh, fairly sort of, I, I seem to appeal to, like, if I think, look at my readership, it's like mostly sort of PhDs and, and, and then a lot of people in tech and there's a lot of money in tech. So, so sometimes I get like offers from rich individuals who want me to work with them and, and so on. And, and it's, it can be really flattering. These are small people, they're interesting offers, but, but it's just, but like the question I have to get back to always is like, if I think about my career, like over the next 50 years, is this the way I optimize the likelihood that I'm going to do interesting work? And, and my wife is really good at telling me that it's not. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't. But then when you, when you say interesting work, I mean, do you, do you think that involves like writing as the majority career or is it like having other things, you know, like the art gallery to pay the bills and then writing as a secondary or like, how do you see that mix changing? Cause I, I, I think you were also a software engineer or a developer. And yeah, I'm a self-taught developer. So I had a software consultancy for, I've done a lot of different things. I worked in a biotech startup and then I had a software consultancy where I did like worked in virtual reality stuff. So, so I've done like various things, but those have always been like, never my passion. There's just, 
you earn a lot of money doing that. So, so, so the, it was like a clever way to fund like time reading, thinking, writing. Yeah. And, and now the art gallery is that for me. Yeah. Like I like the art gallery. It's been a really interesting, I've been there for three years and it's been really interesting to sort of build up that company. But yeah, over the long term, I like my guess is that I will be able to do the best work if, if when like this becomes the full time thing. Because there's so many things that I don't have time to do now that I would want to do. And there's this line of thinking that like, if you go full time, you know, you will write less interesting things. I don't think that is true. I, I think that's like the people say that is a very particular kind of creator, like business creators. I mean, if you look at the great writers of history, most of them did it full time. Like it, it was their life, like they and they had various ways of funding it. They would live with rich people or they would earn money selling their books or whatever, but, but it's clearly possible to do exceptional work doing it full time. And so, so I think eventually something like that will happen and, and maybe I might build some small publishing house to see if it's possible to, to, to do something around that space. Cause I feel like the traditional publishers are like not aligned in doing like really exceptional books anymore. So, so it'd be interesting to see if it's possible to create a niche for that. Wow. Yeah, I, I find it so interesting that you say like there's so much more to come because I, yeah, that's a, I've sort of, as I said, like I, I feel that this is something which I want to explore myself, which is why I'm having this conversation and I imagine that like at some point I would just run out of things or maybe that's like a, some thought, like thinking fallacy because, you know, as, as there's always stuff coming in, like my brain, like just goes, 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 taking like notes all the time. I've stopped trying to do it as much recently. And when I'm reading stuff, I'm also like taking notes on it. So it's like, there's, a, there's like a whole treasure trove of things, but like to convert it into something valuable for others and valuable for myself. And I think that's one thing that you said, which I like really admire is that you have a very high filter on what you put out. I think it probably like stops you publishing a lot of things that other people might deem valuable. And that's one of the things I said in the email to you as well. But and I, I think that's a whole other discussion, which is like, how do you like find that balance of like filtering? But the, yeah, the, I guess the risk is like, it's not self-help your category. It's like, it's, it's agency. It's like figuring out like you know complex relationships and yeah like very nuanced topics and like i want like what's the what's the thread that you see like going through it all i mean i i, I do see myself going through different eras and it's, it's clearly the era right now is is a lot about sort of how do you sort of unfold a design especially around like unfolding a life that is interesting to you and how how like uh, introspection and agency and relationships <clears throat> that that's clearly the, like the big theme for this year. Like if I go back two years, it was more around learning and education. So, so I do go through eras. I, I suspect that like I will, this, this, this era might be a year or two more, and then I'll probably have to change into something else. I have a lot of other threads that I'd like to pull on, but, but it's nice to kind of focus in for a while. But I mean, I, I don't think I could write about this for 30 years uh, without it becoming stale. And there would probably come a time where I will have to step back from like writing the blog every <clears throat> month uh, and, and kind of go do something different, maybe make a documentary or, or things like that. I've done that in the past to just to mix things up. But, but right now I think I'm, I'll be uh, three or four or five years of, of me just going full time doing this. But it's interesting that like the ideas do not cease coming. It sometimes feel like that to me. Like I, I, cause uh, I, I work through like, I, I write maybe one or two essays a week and then I publish maybe half of them. Uh, and so I work through a lot of ideas and, and sometimes I, I get to, to like the bottom list and I, I, I might have still 60 or 70 ideas left, but I'm like, ah, these are kind of bad ideas. Mm. And, but in, in, it's just, then a new good idea comes. So, so they just keep coming. And, and it's also really interesting for me because I, I rarely go back and read my stuff, but I've been thinking about doing a book. So, or, mm. or I'm sketching that out. So I've come back and gone through rereading parts of the blog. 
And, and I can clearly see from my perspective that like a very clear improvement and the ideas are getting more sort of high context, you're zooming in and, and more nuance over the years. Right. So, so, so sometimes I can revisit ideas from before, but I gain so much experience that I can can sort of reconceptualize them or see that like these two ideas that I had in the past are actually, you can sort of generalize them up into a higher like piece. Mm. So, so, so there's, there's this continual kind of uh, upward spiral and, or for me, it feels like an upward spiral for some readers. It might feel like I'm getting more and more esoteric, right? Because like the earlier ideas when I knew less or maybe sometimes easier to digest, they're more conventional. So they might, some of those pieces are more popular and I reread them now and I think, ah, oh, maybe that's a bit too conventional, lacking nuance and, and that nuance that I add now might scare some people off, but that doesn't matter because what matters is the pieces being good. Um, yeah. When you say esoteric, like, what do you mean by esoteric? I guess like, cause I'm thinking you, you're finding these higher levels of abstraction. Do you think it's like a certain worldview is coming through there? Like a, something which springs to mind is that everything is relationship you know, as like a higher, the highest level potentially. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, yeah, that, that is a big thread. Like how, how, like how, so like we're such social creatures. And so we're so much of what happens as, as, you know, like shaped by, by our, our culture and so to that part. And then another angle into the same idea as you were saying there is the, the idea of dialogue, right? So to truly meet another person, you have to sort of assume you don't, don't know who they are, like that they will surprise you and that mm -hmm. your conceptual understanding of what they are is, is not the truth so that you can sort of look for the gap where, where they surprise you. And, and that is going to sort of bring out a lot of sort of aliveness in our relationship and a lot of insight from yourself. And, and that idea of sort of applies across the domains. You can have a, like a dialogical relationship with a theory or, or with, a, with a garden or, or something like it, so that that's an idea that is really kind of reoccurs all the time, but of having this kind of open mind to that, what you understand as the world is, is not, not necessarily what is there. And this, and also just this kind of very exploratory, like that you don't have to have an end in sight. Like you can have mm. beyond this open-ended quest where you just like you look where you are now and so what's the most interesting kind of path and then you kind of do gradient descent that's also sort of a theme i noticed that kind of pops up in various disguises throughout my writing what you just said they made me feel a bit guilty because i've come in with like a whole bunch of like preparation questions and you know have much more context about you than you have about me <laughs> it feels like it can be a little bit like, so you must be this and you must be this or like i don't know that's not, that's not the point. I just wanted to come in quite prepared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I think that's f fair. And we were talking before about, like, I wrote that piece about conversational canyon. Like a lot mm. of times when I talk with people, I know, well, I, I prepare questions before and I, I often record and trans transcribe our conversations and I like keep a lot of records so that I will be able to sort of, because I notice for me that a lot of the time when I'm having conversations, there's this like door that opens like a really interesting idea and you go down that rabbit hole and then you call each other two weeks later and you forget that and you start talking about Donald Trump or some really uninteresting thing and and it's really useful for me to just have a list of those really interesting prompts that you have encountered so I have them kind of listed out like we can return to that and I find that to be really powerful to kind of collect those openings but then I sort of keep that to the side and I'll see mm. if something interesting happens. But if like it goes for three or four minutes and it's kind of boring conversation, I'll just go and pick the, from the list and then we'll go down. That's pretty cool. One thing which like I also, I, I, let me, let me start with a question before answering it myself, because some of, you know, you shared this waste book thing with me and I think I'm seeing as like a bit of an evolution in the way that you're handling audience as well. But in the beginning, it seemed like, and I still experience this, that you're very welcoming, you open feedback, you, you are, you increase your surface area to the world quite like in, in quite a large way. And I, then, you know, people send their essays to you for comments and, you know, that's, I imagine that's quite a burden on your time though. Like, is it like, or do you actually enjoy that as part of your input process? Is that part of like the relating? 
I mean, it's, it's getting harder. It was really, I, I, I started doing that early on and, and, and it was really, really powerful when I was a, sort of, until I had, let's say 2000 subscribers or something, because it created this very rich kind of literary scene around myself or like, that's how it felt to me. And, and I met a lot of interesting friends that way. It gets to a point, right? Like where I, I'll get five essays from strangers a week and, and, and they want me to read them, comment them. And, and, and I can't, I just simply can't. So I've had to kind of cut back on that, of course. And, and, and I'm not sure exactly like how to, there's something valuable there and I don't know how to build on that community thing. It's, it gets harder at scale. And the waste book thing you mentioned. So, so for those who don't know what that is, is that I've had a, like a terrible blog where I write really fast and uh, terrible pieces on that kind of whole secret. And, and that's been really nice because that of course is, is almost no one's found it. I think it's like 80 subscribers or something. And that really creates that feeling again, because like everyone who's nerdy enough to find it has been really interesting. So I get that feeling again and I'm, I can take more risks and it's really nice to have that conversation, but there's something that happens with scale that. It, it, it's, you know, like good money chases out bad money or bad money chases out good money. Like at certain scale, like the annoying people get, get more obvious. So, so I don't know how to do it at scale. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. I, uh, I mean, there's a whole opportunity, I guess, there in like doing writing, coaching or something like that, but I'm, I'm assuming that's not your, uh, an area that you would like to play in. Yeah, I mean, th that is an option, like, the, to, like, I, I'm at some point when I transition, it, it, there might be a transition period where I'll be like, yes, give me a hundred dollars and read and comment on your essay to keep that service for those who are willing to pay. I don't know. Like, that could be a, an option. It's, it's not top of mind right now. I, I really don't like to think in those terms. I really, really enjoy thinking in this very sort of long-term way where it just it's about cultivating relationships and being very generous and doing the right thing and just trusting that all the time, you know, that that will lead to something interesting. You don't have to have like a business plan or a strategy or anything. You just do proper work, like be, be, be interested in people and curious and welcoming and interesting things will just happen from that. And it's played out well so far. And I was, so I, I work in an art gallery and I, I, I saw the, I was working with two artists who are very, very, very successful and as you, they shouldn't be exhibiting at our art gallery there, but, but they did because it's fun for them. But so it's extremely successful people like make tons and tons of money and, but they're, ex but it's really interesting to see people who are like, they're very much like at the top of their field. And it's interesting to see people like that work because it's, you don't get to that level by being ruthless and being selfish, right? Always when you meet people who are at that level as they are, they are very, very down to earth, very helpful. And it, 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 it's because you have to build this kind of goodwill and this, this network of people that help each other to get to that kind of level. You, can't, you just can't do it on your own. So what I found was really interesting with these people, like, so, so they are, I mean, they, they could be. They don't, they don't have to work anymore or anything. And, and well, they had sold a, we had sold a big expensive art piece, a uh, light installation and, uh, and we installed it yesterday as so, and the day before they installed it, the, the artists themselves, they have assistants and stuff, but the artists themselves, they came in and they're like, oh, we found a better electronic component. The, the, the one we have is really good, but we found one that's slightly better. So we're just going to spend 10 hours changing all of that and re like redoing it. We're not going to tell the customer it's just, it's just slightly better. So we're going to do that for free and not tell anyone. And, and, and so that was sort of their attitude. And, and when you see people work like that, you're like, okay, I understand why these people have achieved massive success. It's because, you know, like you can trust them. Like they're, they're these are really honest people and they only care about the quality of their crafts. So of course, like, it took them a long time. I was talking to them and like the, for the first 10 years, there's is a husband and a wife duo. For the first 10 years, they like worked 70 hour weeks and, and it was really, really tough. But because of their kind of authentic, sincere, genuine, like 
deep care for what they do. They develop this super powerful relationship that allows them to do really, really great art now. And, and they make money, but they don't care about the money because like, so everything gets reinvested into making even greater art. So, and and I, I, I find just that way of doing it really inspiring. And, and it's painful mm. as hell for it may be first 10, 20 years. But I, 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 yeah, I, I don't like cutting corners. Yeah, sure. My mind goes into like very interesting avenues there because I definitely think I've come from like a scarcity mindset of like, there's not enough in the world, like fear that I won't have enough, fear that like, you know, and also living in South Africa where you very, like you see poverty very closely, like it's like a, it's almost like a, I need to make money so that I don't go to that level. But I, I like the, the shift in perspective to be like, it's not about the monetary, it's not about the economics. I mean, it's amazing that like there's a sub stack that exists that allows for like people to actually monetize, you know, what you're doing. <laughs> Which I think is like inspiring, like the, the revealing yourself online. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, you have to think about the money, and 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 I'm I'm privileged, you know, like in that I've made some fairly good decisions previously in my life. So I'm in a situation where my living expenses are not that high, and I, I you know, I live cheaply, and I, and so on. So then I'm I'm able to do this, and and I there's free healthcare in Denmark, and so on. So. Like there are many contexts where I wouldn't be able to do this and I would have to be more selfish than I am. But, but that is also so like when you have that privilege, like where I've ended up in this situation where I have fairly low running costs, like that for me, that means there's a responsibility. Like I could actually pull this off. Most people can't. And then I should, like, I, I I'm really, yeah. I'm, I'm there, there's a, like a responsibility that comes with privilege. And I think, I mean, uh, Compared to most of my readers, I'm not privileged. Most of my readers are more privileged than me. But, but I, I feel a lot of people do not fully own their privilege and like use their privilege. I sometimes get to talk to very rich individuals. And I, I'm a little disappointed with, with like the wealthy today that they, they don't have aspirations. They're like, they, they're good at capital and, and like investing. And there's a lot of good things that come out of that. But like, yeah, okay, so we will like, build satellites and stuff, but like, what will we do after that? Like, what's the next thing? Like, what's the, you know, the idea of like trying to cultivate like a higher civilization? I don't think a lot of people fully kind of own up to like, what they could do with their resources and, and, and their time mm. if they, they made more sacrifices. Yeah, I think there's like a curve of, like, obviously, like a, a bell curve. And a lot of people are in the just trying to make ends meet, can't think about anything. And then there's like a, a sort of middle zone where it's like, oh, I've got enough coming in and there's wife, kids, too much to to like even think about. And then I'm, you know, I don't have a family or anything. And I, I think I'm on this other part of the curve, which is like, oh, I, I can meet my needs and I don't have to worry about these things. And I've, I don't, I don't have a boss that's telling me what to do. So then I, I sort of have this freedom of deciding what I want to do. And th that speaks very much to the whole unfolding thing. And, and it's like that, it, it, depending on which side we go on the curve now, that's like the anxious, like, oh shit side of it. But then there's like the, oh wow, this is a privilege. Like I can use this and I can like actually channel myself and like serve mm -hmm. in some way that it's not about like, the ego self, like making sure that I'm okay or whatever, but like, there's like a, a relaxing into being of, I don't know, beyond just like, I need to meet my needs and yeah. yeah. And I think, I think that po like that point that, 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 and like that comes a lot, like if you're being realistic about it, that point comes a lot earlier than people think. You see that with like a lot of people, like they, how much money do I need to retire? And you see these like ridiculous numbers. People think they need so much, you know, before they take the leap and do the thing they they want to do and or contribute to the world in the way they feel is true. And, and they think they need so much more. It's, it's you really don't like, like, I, I mean, I'm privileged. I have a house, but like my living standards or, or my family's living standards is like not, not high. You know, like we've had several years. We didn't have hot water. We, we don't own a car and we live, Far in the countryside, where I spend, I, I spend like five, six hours on bike every every week. You know, so I, I do make some sacrifices, but like 
it's still a good life, you know, like I, I can go to the supermarket and get food from the supermarket, like an avocado in the middle of the winter. It's like, I, I live an extremely privileged life in that yeah. sense. I can go to the library and get books because we have a really good library system in Denmark. But but you you can do a lot. Like if you sacrifice certain things, you have a lot more freedom and possibility and responsibility that comes with that than people realize. And I think it's very liberating to realize that you have those possibilities and that responsibility because I think responsibility is very, very liberating too. Mm. I mean, in terms of like your community, so you're on the island, I understand, mm-hmm. you, do you have like friends in your age group that, you know, on a similar life sort of area as you, was that all online that you're getting that thing, um, that, that sort of level of in- connection? Yeah, no, it's mostly online. I, I, I do, I mean, I do have good relationships on the island. I have uh, several friends who work on, on the startups and stuff, which is kind of related, live on the island and homeschool and so are in the similar situations like they work uh and and i have i through my work i spend a lot of time with artists so so and that's also kind of similar uh, lifestyle in some ways i have that but of course my my close closest relationships are are online um because it's just you can find these incredible kind of fits of personality when you when you're uh, online so so my deepest relationships apart from my wife is is over email or zoom calls yeah. oh wow <laughs> that's very uh very antithetical to what i would have thought for, for well at least for myself i guess I, this is the projection where i i don't like zoom calls or emails or like any like I, in person is almost like a must for me i've just realized that like i don't know I, yeah i mean i do get about... that a lot like so i meet like through my day job i, I meet so many extremely many people so, so i have that and that uh, i'm fairly introverted so I, I get almost a little bit too much of that I, i'm I personally kind of like, like my, I think my ideal life would be maybe talking to people for an hour a day and for that phone calls are really good because you can make it exactly an hour and then you, so I'm quite introverted. So, so, but yeah, people are different. <laughs> yeah. Something I wanted to ask, like to get into like practical stuff is that the, well, not practical, but like more on this, on the, the output side, I see you've become quite active on Twitter recently. Well, not recently but like your grow, your following has grown from when when i started following you, you were like three thousand, and now you're above like seven thousand. and i i when i started following you i was on about like 2800 and at the moment i'm still on 2800 and something so like my following is just like stagnant and i've not consciously but i just don't i haven't posted on twitter because i have been going through some life events and just figuring stuff out and but I, I'm, I'm thinking about doing it more now although I'm, I'm i'm cautious about the like the dopamine hit instant feedback addictive potential of yeah getting into that approval cycle because it's, it's so nice to be seen i mean this is like i think a, a, a core human need is being seen and now that your blog has grown, I, I, I don't think there'll ever be a time where you will not be seen online. And maybe it's the same for me with the YouTube channel, very different sort of audience or whatever. But like, I can put a, a video out and be seen very quickly. But but at, at some level, I feel like it's actually not being seen. It's like not, I, I, I am trying to show more of myself. That's why I published that essay on like my whole spiritual journey or whatever. But really it's only the people who are really close to me who've seen like the the proper in the in the weeds figuring things out and then i sort of come out the other side and i publish an article or whatever like and i feel twitter might exacerbate that process or like or not exacerbate it but maybe like cheapen my or distract me from actually doing other meaningful things so it's more of a question that, statement. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, but it, it, it's a it's a very complex topic. I I remember. So so I've always focused much much more on, on a blog than a social media. I'm, I'm very sort of unusual in that combination because most people build a social media thing and they channel people to to a blog, and I I've done the other way around. Yeah, and uh, I remember when some of my things started to go viral on on Twitter like one and a half years ago, that was very 
strange experience that very like very very strong sort of emotional reaction like i said i share that looking for alice that i say about how i met my wife well very personal thing and then it just blew up on twitter and and i, I got like so many dms and people writing and i've never had anything at all like that happen and and it made me feel like extreme dopamine right for the first two or three days like it just that suddenly you felt alone and like so many people see you and, and it's, at the same time, it just feels weird. And then after a few days, I started to feel like really sick by it. Like this, it felt really, oh, I hated it. And sent and sent. And after that, I kind of didn't use Twitter a lot at all. And then I recently kind of started using it more sort of pragmatically because I, I use it to, the, the main thing that's made my, my, my account grow is that I've started to sort of repost quotes from mm. past essays. Because I think it's it's a shame that like I write an essay and I'll live for two weeks and then people forget about it. So I I, I figured I could revitalize them by by reposting and uh, essays and and then I I've had several like of those quotes kind of go viral and that's really really nice because it drives people back and reread the stuff that I wrote like two years ago. So that's what I've been doing and that's like kind of as a side effect is that my account grew a lot. And I also sometimes, if I'm tired, use Twitter as a way to sort of sketch out ideas, which can be nice because I can figure out like a framing that people understand. And that is like, because when you're on the internet, you have to sort of respect that people, I mean, it depends. There's a lot of context there, but like <laughs> the first version of what I'm saying is, is, is this like, so you have to respect that a lot of people that read my things will be coming in from Twitter or Instagram or, or somewhere and they'll just see something and, and, and you have to kind of respect that that's the context. They're on the phone, on the toilet or whatever. And, and, and you have to sort of make it clear for them if is how to read it. You like, you have to understand the context you're writing for. Like you, you can't write the way you would write in a magazine or mm -hmm. something. You have to write in a different way because of that context, because people, you have to a short time to kind of explain why this would be a valuable time for them or not, right? So, so they can decide if they want to swipe uh, left or right, right? <laughs> uh, and, and Twitter is good to kind of evaluate that. You can, I can trade different framings to see if like, is this a good opening for referencing and so on. The tricky thing is of course, like you get validation on an idea. And then when I try out ideas on Twitter, it, it's harder for me to kind of look at the thing. I was like, oh, but actually it's better to do it this way. Mm. But I know that like it will be less successful because I've tried it out on Twitter. So that makes it hard to do that. And the thing I wanted to add is that, so this is when I write on the free list, because that then a lot of people who don't know me get there. So I have to understand like the context of those people. When I write to the paid list, I can assume they know what I'm doing. And that's a completely different situation where I can be more high context and, and, and so on. And I don't have to think about that, uh, which is to some extent I prefer writing to the paid list, which like gets read by fewer people, but those people have high context so I can be more personal and go deeper and more nuanced. And uh, I think that's something I want to lean into more, like being in this, that kind of process oriented kind of writing uh, somehow the paid list. I haven't figured that out, but that's kind of the experiment with the waste book is to figure out like, how can I find a sort of valuable way of sharing in a more high context way for people who want to have a more kind of more high context understanding of where I am and what I'm thinking about and sort of how I'm processing things. So, so it's, yeah, so I don't remember the question, but, but I ended up somewhere. It's, no, I mean, <laughs> the, the Twitter dopamine avoiding the distraction. Yeah. Yeah. Mode, but I think you're using it. Yeah. But it, and another thing to add about that. So, so I really hate Substack for this reason is that like you get a green, I don't know if you have a Substack, but like you get a dashboard and you see like how many subscribe today and blah, blah, blah. Is it, this is absolutely not the information I as a writer need. Like it's good for me to know maybe once a month for every second month, like how the sort of business side is doing, but it's not at all interesting for me day to day. So I've like, I've had to sort of uh, go in and like rewrite like how the page looks to me. So I don't see any statistics when I go in and look at Substack, there's no stats because I prefer that design. Right. So I don't want to think about that. And, and so, and also like with Twitter, it's, I, I have very much like an arm length to it. So I don't 
track like how well things are doing. So so it doesn't affect me the same. But it's 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 irritating that it has to be something that is consciously designed for like and think about yeah. like how to construct these uh, zones because because these tools are not designed with the user in mind like and and they can be extremely powerful like if you are uh, sort of hack them and use them in ways they're not intended to be used i feel like the way i use all of these platforms is like not how they're intended to be used like i'm yeah. not self stacking in the right way i'm not using i haven't used twitter in the right way maybe i'm using twitter more in the right way now but i've always tried to use these tools in ways they're not intended to be used but but, but it's irritating that you have to kind of duct tape them to create these more meaningful experiences. Yeah. But I guess you're solving for your own needs and you, but you're very clear on what you need and, and that gives you or clear on, on your values, I guess. And that gives you like very clear boundaries as to like when, where you will and won't go. Whereas I think most people sort of just fall into the lane by default yeah, rather than design. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm super, like, I'm, I'm very Amish in that way. Like, because like, <laughs> the way I think of, like, the, the Amish, like, what, the, what they're doing is they, they're, like, they have a very clear framework for what their values are. And then, like, when there's new technologies that come out, right, they look at that technology and it's like, does this support the thing we're trying to, the culture we're trying to build? Yes or no. And they only accept technologies that do. So, you know, like. They have accepted telephones, not maybe in all houses, but like it's useful the telephone to call the hospital. So they have like one in every village and, and they have rubber wheels nowadays. And like, so they've taken some things that support and then they, but they don't do like central heating, for example, because that means people will spread out in the house and be in different rooms. They want to have heating in one room. So people call, uh, go and sit around the fireplace and meet, you know, so, so they decide yeah. which technologies to use depending on what they're trying to design for. I have different values, but I try to be very clear about like my values and goals. And so I've never had a smartphone, for example. You mentioned that in one of the articles and like, how, how do you then get your nice screenshots on Twitter? Just like random practical question, because I really like the screenshots that you show with your highlighted articles. I want to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, I used to print, like I, I, it's, it's Obsidian and I print screen in Obsidian. Yeah, it's just, yeah. I just format the screen. So I, I, again, like I want to be gentle to the people because I know most people who read it on an on on a iPhone yeah. screen. So, so I, I format it so, so they can read it in that way, but I, I do it on my laptop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like that could go into a very easy segue about software and whatever, which is, you know, how I started this channel and which would, I think a lot of readers would appreciate, but I don't want to go there just yet because something you said now really intrigued me and i think it's a bit of a provoking question but like you know you speak uh, like uh, now that i'm thinking back I, have, I haven't read much of your earlier things on like education and homeschooling and stuff but that was all in the lead up to your decision of of if you wanted to stay in sweden or what you were going to do with your with your children's education and part of me is thinking now it's a sort of judgment i'm just going to say say what it is or maybe not a judgment but it's like isn't it exhausting living an intentional life? Like, you know, and not living <laughs> within the confines of society. Because I think you live very deliberately, you engage with your wife in a way I think that, that I find inspiring, but like, sure, it must be very time consuming to, you know, take, there's so many things that we take for granted, education and you know, being one of the basic ones, but it's probably one of the most important ones. But it, it, I, people don't have the resource. Well, I, I, we probably found ourselves in a place where we don't have resources because everything else is happening to us. And we just like. Oh, it's so interesting, like all the excuses you make, like you, you yes. open, you, I, 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 mean, I do that with different things myself. Is just, you start doing something and you find justifications for doing it that way. But actually there's some kind of fear or whatever uh, that's behind it. And like, if you go push through and down to the fear, you're like, no, actually like those justifications are just kind of post hoc. Yeah, is it exhausting to live an intentional life? Yes and no. There have been periods where it's been brutal because you may, like, we've, so, so, so for example, like when we moved from Sweden to Denmark, having to learn a new language, Denmark is more expensive than Sweden. And there was, you know, a year when like, I couldn't heat my studies. I was like writing and my hands would get so cold and 
and it was like really terrible and hard as hell. And and there was a period there where like I thought I couldn't, I can't make this. Like I I, I it was a period where it was, it was just so rough going through all that that I I I got like sick. So I was like in bed. I couldn't get out of bed for like three weeks because I was just so exhausted from from all of the things I had to like push through to 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 align my life with what I wanted to do, like with the homeschooling and, and, and everything. But like once I'm, and, and, and if you are more clever than me, maybe you could find a way to do that without all of those like really hard periods and sacrifices. But like once I was through that, right? So once I was on the other side of like making those sacrifices, it's, it's incredible. I think it's like, they're not hard. Like it is so, it's so good, you know, I, I just like, I mean, like, don't I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly sensitive person, but like, I literally like cry, you know, sometimes I just like go out on the farm and I look at my kids playing here. And I, I think about like the fact that I get to spend time writing and it's just, you know, like how, like on earth, like, are we allowed to do this? So, so no, now it's, it's only good. It's interesting though, because I, th- like, I imagine that you probably like a, a wayfinder for other people, you know, the reason that it was so hard for you is because there's no examples and or maybe maybe they were i don't know but in my mind i'm thinking if i were to think about this i now have your writing or your experience to lean on which would be a beacon to help me make those decisions myself you know i'm far away from having to make those decisions so it's fine but like it's you know i guess some you taking shots for people that are coming after you, so that's a good thing. Yeah, video. I think I think what we as people, everyone, what everyone is doing is contributing to culture in some way. Like, so all of your public actions are it's culture making, and I, I take that seriously. Like the way I express myself and communicate becomes the part, a small part of, of different people's culture, right? And and it's not going to be a big thing, but like I take care of my corner of it. I try to articulate um, what is hard and what works and whatever for me and articulate certain values and norms, like as my way of caring for my part of the culture. And you can join and be close to that culture if you want, but we all have that kind of responsibility. And, and I think there is many, many more people than me doing this in, in on various levels of scale, like from people just with their friends and so on. But like, a, I think there is, I, I'm, I'm clearly like not the person doing it. Like I but do really feel like I'm part of, of, of a culture in some way where as in every time, right? So there's technological changes, the economic landscape changes, all these things changes. And then you have to have people who are like on the fringe that are willing to run the experiments and kind of try to figure out like what is like the proper way of being in this new situation. Like we've seen that many, many times before, like with the enlightenment, I'm not going to compare like that. I'm, what I'm doing is the enlightenment, but the, what they were doing was just these small groups of nerds that were communicating and building new norms and ideas and practices. And then gradually that kind of spread into becoming a watered down version of what they were doing and became sort of the modern world. And, and I think with the internet and so on, we have to have, there's the, a similar kind of small groups of people that are experimenting and figuring out new ways of doing it. And those things kind of gradually spread. And I, and I I'm a small part of, uh, I'm trying to be a small part and take my responsibility in, in that kind of cultural movement. To challenge you though, like on, on that, like I, I feel it's not necessarily a challenge. It's more of like an encouragement. And, and it's the same thing that I said in, in the email, which is like, what's holding you back from publishing more because of the, like your scope like maybe it, maybe it's the, the the scope of your ideas being you know seen and reached but I, I feel like you've got there's so many people who are like blathering on the internet just using chat gpt and producing content for the sake of content and then every now and again you find like someone who's really thought through some thought through things so i, I think like yourself sasha i, I, I see you also read sasha I've started to enjoy his writing recently. And that's like, I find those sort of things really valuable. And yet you put such a high filter on your own <laughs> contribution. <laughs> like, wh- what are you afraid of in that context? 
Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's the opportunity cost, right? There's something that happens in the writing when I spend a long time on a piece and I really go deep uh, in both in, in researching and reading. I, I do a lot of reading and I try, like, I really cite the reading because I, I don't like to show off in that way. I, I try to kind of metabolize it and, and, and make it part of my perspective more and more going in that direction of just trying to write for myself. But, but there's something that happens, like, some, like sometimes I'll have a piece around for like a year in, 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 in my computer and I'll revisit it occasionally and then maybe I'll read another book or uh, talk to someone and, and then I'll, I'll figure out I can reframe it or, and then I'll rewrite it from scratch and I'll sometimes do that for a year. And there's something that happens in that process that's a very interesting way of working for me because there's like always these deeper layers to an idea. And if... So, so, and, and this is, and if you do it's like what Sasha is doing, where you write very rapidly and just publishes it, I often feel when I read his work and I, we are sort of distant friends and, and I really like the way he thinks, but I often feel like with him, it's like, there's these hooks and deeper ideas that you're not extracting. And it's, that, that's his personality. Like, I don't think he could do it. It's just, that's not how he works. So, so he, what he's doing is right for him. But, but, but there's something that happens when I, I spend six months on a piece and really goes deep and feels it and reframes it. And, and I often feel that few people are willing to do that. So, so, so the fact that I am willing to do that means I have sort of a responsibility to do that to some extent. Mm. And, and there's just like these deeper ideas that emerge lived in me by doing that. And if I take time to write more faster pieces, for example, right, then I take time from doing that work and also Sometimes I'll write two or three drafts on a piece. It's not quite there. There's something wrong. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't feel true. And I get to a point where I was like, I can choose. Like I can work on, on this piece or on this piece. And it's the opportunity cost. Like I put in maybe 30 hours of work on this, but finishing it would be maybe 15 hours more. And it's not worth it because I, I could... It, I could do more interesting work by spending that, those hours on, on, on this other piece. There's this trade-off there because so, often the pieces are not like done so I can publish them because if I, I put those out, like it would, they're not ready, right? So, so, so mm -hmm. it's hard to, to find that. Like what is like, it, it's almost like, like I'm moving through this landscape and I'm always kind of trying to think about like what is the optimal thing for me to spend my time on and it's and it's really hard to make the decision because the landscape is is in fog because i like should i take a step in this direction or that direction and i have limited resources and 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 that ends up looking like i spend a lot of time and i throw a lot of things away so that said like i'm i am trying to uh, this year has been a lot of experiments with me trying to figure out like is there some way to extract more of the value from those dead ends mm. or the things that I don't like push all the way to completion. And, and the waste book has been one of those experiments. And I've done some experiments on the main blog too, where I'm trying to sort of figure out like, is there these ways that I can share more of the process and all of these things that I'm doing that only takes me maybe 40 minutes to write up or something. And the, the, so I can, uh, but it's really, really hard to find the trade-off because like, because there is, there are opportunity costs. Like if I, where to write, like, I could write, can, I can, I'm perfectly able to write a post every day if I want to, right? I can physically do that. And that would probably be interesting. Some people would probably like that even more than what I'm doing now. But I, my guess is that that over 50 years time would not lead to the most interesting work I can, but it's, it's a very, very hard kind of risk analysis or whatever that I have to run in my head all the time. Yeah. Sure. What you said there really resonates because like I, I've, I've struggled with like cost benefit analysis in my own life, but not on the, like the writing side of things. And I, maybe I'm maybe I'm even positioning it as a struggle is not the right framing because it, it sounds like for you, it's a rich and rewarding exploration. Whereas for me, I'm like, oh shit, do I spend time with this? Like a friend who needs me now, or do I go and work? Or do I, in the last few years, like working for myself has been a challenge to like, you know, for instance, I'm going to send this to the friend who, who recommended me your blog, and I'm, I'm just going to bring up the story where, you know, he's in Singapore, he's six hours ahead of me, he finishes work and he gives me a call. And I'm like, in the middle of our work day, this is like one of my 
well, my best friend and I enjoy chatting to him. And yet I'm still thinking like, I'm, oh, well, I want to be working and I want to build this relationship. Like how, like there's so many good things in the world. How do I do all of them? And like, how do I, yeah, make sure that I yeah. get to it all. I, so, yeah, I hate that. I, 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 I so much hate the, the, that fact that, about the world and I, and I, I live that like so intensely, you know, like having the kids like in the house running around and like, I, I, there's so like there's so many more things I would love to do for my kids, and there's so many people I would like to call talk to, and there's so many essays that I'm not able to finish up. Like there's, like, and I'm there's so many interesting, good things and beautiful things to do in the world, and I was like, I have so little time, and 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 just it it's it's a really interesting and frustrating challenge of like trying to think about like what is, what's so like of all of these things, like what are my priorities and. And, it, but it's really easy to get caught up in like making the wrong decision. That's why like being intentional is so important to me because, because like, it's so easy to get caught up, like looking on YouTube clips or doing like all of these sorts of things, which are, can be good. Like if, if you sort of intentionally, I need to relax now, or this YouTube clip is, it's exactly talking about the things I'm thinking about right now. So it's a good use of time, but it's easy to get up, caught up, just being led on and doing things. And you have so little resources, there's so little time and, 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 and so that's just like, so in some ways I've really liked getting my life into this very overloaded state, like with, with the kids and, and having two jobs, if, if you count the blog as a job, is that it's just like made me so constrained that has forced me to be more intentional. And that's really kind of it's been very liberating in that sense, because like, I only like literally only have like, sometimes I'll only have two hours in a day that I can do the, the things I value. And like, then you have to be, then you can't fool yourself and think that you can do everything. Yeah. Can I tell you something that I've just realized, which I had a cold shiver down my spine. It's been recording, but I've only been recording your face. Because I, I, when I, when I talk to someone on Zoom, I always like make their face big so I don't look at myself. But now I'm thinking, if if I'm correct, and I think that I am correct, I think Zoom only records what I'm displaying, and I'm going to be so pissed off if that's the case. Ah, I might have to just turn it into a podcast then, unless you're okay with like just your face being on <laughs> on a video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the. the, 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 the doesn't matter oh. to me. You you make the call. <laughs> That'd be so frustrating. I mean, I was I was actually just thinking like I I want to make this a podcast because I am not so worried about yeah doing the software side of things because I do find it interesting. I mean, like the you you've spoken about like transcriptions, how you're using Obsidian, how you're layering things, how you and Johanna. How do I say her name? Johanna. Johanna, how you have like a shared Google Docs that you like write in. I'm like, this is all fascinating. But yeah, the the more that like I, I, I chat to you, the more I think this isn't actually that important, like the software side. But yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think it's easy to overestimate the software side. I mean, I do use a lot and I'm like, yeah, it's like the, the thing I talked about earlier, like I don't have smartphones, like I've n I never have smartphones. Like, so I'm very sort of selective, but certain things I'm very early on and certain things I'm like smartphone, I'm extremely late on and, and, and like, but, but like with LLMs, for example, I was very early instead. So, I'm, so I'm, yeah, so I find tools very interesting to play around with, but like the more I work, the more I realize it's just, it's, it's just about doing the work, you know, like the, I used to structure my notes super cleanly and, and stuff like that, but like you get to a certain point and where you realize it's just, it's, it's it's basically just a force of your personality. Like I just have to submit to my nature and I use, I mean, I use Obsidian and I throw all kinds of shit there. It's, there's no structure, but I just, it's kind of this adjusting time. I just try to spend as little time as possible thinking about that stuff or thinking about formatting or anything, right? Like, because I want to have, that's opportunity cost, right? Thinking about, I want to have just enough structure that it's likely that I can find my way back and like resurface things. But, but nothing more than that because 
I don't have time. That's correct. Okay. I, I, and, and it says I've definitely seen the evolution of, of my, 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 my writing in that way. That's just used to be kind of top down thought out, like the way I structured my notes. And now it's, it's very much kind of organic and, and the entire kind of layout of how I structure it just evolves all the time, depending on my needs, where I'll just, uh, kind of restructure everything. Usually, you know, you just make a new note and start linking things and, and because this is the way I want to approach what I'm doing right now. So I'm just going to do a new, that's, that's one of the things I like about using some obsidian is that it's very easy to make sort of a new interface. So if, if, mm. if my way of thinking about what I'm doing changes, I, I'll just make a new note and I'll, this is my new start page and I'm re restructuring that. Or, and but, do, you, do you link your notes quite like density or do you, I mean, do you say related notes at the bottom and then just like create all the links or do you have like a Zettelkasten approach or what's your... I mean, I, I mean pragmatically speaking, most of what I do right now, like goes, I'd have like a, a page with essay ideas and, and that's sort of my, my homepage. And then I have maybe 70 SEI essays or essay ideas that I'm working on. And those become sort of the rooms that things connect to. And then if I get bored by something, I'll just delete it, you know, like, so it's, it's, it's chaotic in that way. So I don't try to keep like everything organized. So like, there's a lot of orphans, like of essays that I just got bored and then I just made them an orphan and, and, and then I have like writing notes and, and stuff in other places, but just, yeah, it's very much like. Yeah. So there is like an old part of my system, which is very structured and organized, but like, I noticed like when I'm working with time pressure and trying to optimize, it's just interesting to see what structure kind of evolves organically from my needs as I kind of, oh, she's just where to find this. Oh, that's really important. I'm going to just link it here because that's where I'm usually at on Tuesdays. Like, so it's just, there's no system. Like I, it's nothing mm. I could like explain to someone else. It's just, I guess it's like the. I'm trying to use the software in a very sort of agentic way and being very sort of introspective about like what are my needs and my intentions and, and being very clear, but like, I don't have to follow a system or anything. I can change it depending on my needs and being sort of agentic and open-minded about like, because the software is so flexible. It's just, you can have any system or structure. So there's no point in like following a system if that system is not like perfectly aligned what you're, I'm doing. So I'll just tweak it and then my goals will change and I'll tweak it again. You know, like it's, yeah. but I mean, that probably comes from like, I know how to do settle Castan and stuff like that. And I've been having various note taking systems for maybe a decade. So as I have a lot of experience that gives me a lot of templates that I can pull on, but I try to be very kind of brutal and chaotic about it and follow my needs. It reminds me of something which I think any of two checks is like note taking mm -hmm. or people who make videos or content on note-taking software often have or don't have a serious context of use. And yeah. I think that's why like I am trying to publish more writing because it's such a good forcing mechanism to actually think about like different ways of structuring it. But as you say, like it, it, it's sort of mine is much messier than other people's systems. Like, you know, perfect Zettelkast and numbering, whatever. I don't do that. Like I just have like mm -hmm. essay ideas as well, lots of drafts lots of tags so I can like find things again. I often just use search just to like find the keyword. Like, you know, I, I used to have all these yeah. queries, which looks up all the ideas nasty and I could filter them. Now I'm just like using search a lot more. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just search all the time and, and yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I probably, yeah, I do a lot of the things I am fairly good at linking together and, and stuff to, to create paths, but just like not in a very systematic way, but it's, but it's interesting what you're saying about like, you know, having a serious context of use, because it's interesting to see what happens to my notice taking system when I apply the force of a, like a very serious context of use, like when I'm, when I'm kind of escalating how, how much I write and like the pressures I put on that, like it, it, it comes like a definitely like a pressure field that goes through my systems and all the tools I use. And they are like forced to fold around that because, because there's so much urgency in what I'm doing that the tools just kind of have to bend to that, you know, and that it's useful to have tools that are easy to bend when you, you do that. But, 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 but what you end up with looks like nothing like the rigorous kind of top down systems and. And then it of course connects back to unfolding because it's about the context. Like, cause you, you can't design a good 
note-taking system if you do not have a serious context because it's the context and the force field of the your needs in the context that it's going to tell you what the right design is. And if you don't have a serious context of use, you, you can't design something like because a, a, a note-taking system is, is a, a project that you design to solve a problem. And if you don't have a problem, like yeah. you're trying to build, like, and how do you know if this is the right, like you, you, you with design, like, should I have tags or should I have a index or whatever? Like, how do you know if you don't know what your problem is? Like, you have to know what the problem you're solving. Otherwise you can't, you know, but as soon as you have something that's like a really urgent, serious problem you're trying to solve, like the, the system, you'll kind of screaming and kicking kind of start folding itself and yeah. shaping it into something. And it will look more like a rainforest, you know, because it's organic. Yeah, I really feel like search is one of the most important principles in like any note-taking system. That if you just trust your search, the things will emerge. And the tags and stuff help definitely. Like I've found so much benefit in tags and, you know, the things coexisting in multiple different places. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's just about being able to find information again. But when, yeah. when, you, do, when you do edits with Johanna, does she do the, the edits in like a separate obsidian file do you send them to google docs and then send them back or how do you like yeah we use google docs for the edits okay. yeah so so usually what, what happens when i send so we have oh, that's also like a whole story about how we edit but like we have a like it, it's funny because I, I work with a lot of magazines and stuff and it, it, what we do is not at all what they do so it's usually usually when you work with an editor in a magazine you have a pitch meeting you frame it, what you're doing, and then you're kind of expected to deliver basically the idea you had up front, which I think is a ridiculous thing because the whole point <laughs> of writing is to have ideas. And then you deliver that and then people look at it, oh, it's kind of messy. And then they start moving small things and like copy edits and, and spelling and removing things. With Johanna, hey, right? what we do instead is like, we'll have conversations and then we'll go like, uh, and they'll read things. Or I'll have an idea and I'll write it down or, or I'll write down a conversation we had and then I'll send it to her and she'll read through it and she'll go like, that one paragraph is interesting. Remove everything else. And I have these three questions I want you to answer from that context. Can you send me a new doc where you answer that question? I'll write that. And she'll go through and then she'll cut out like maybe half of that and she'll rearrange it and she'll make some notes. I don't think the introduction should have that. And, and you, I don't think you underbuilt this and and then I'll write that out and she'll say, oh, well, no, this is framed wrong. And then she'll throw everything away again and then she'll kind of reorganize it and then she'll go like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And then some often what happens is that I'll just look at that and then I will retype that idea from from scratch. Oh, yeah, um, that, that's just one example of how it can look, but, but it's a very different, more collaborative, intense kind of editing. Um, yeah, I feel like the universe has gifted you a partner uh, in line with your goals of, you know, reaching your, well, being the, the most authentic expression of yourself. And, and because, I mean, that level of engagement from an, a person who was your editor, there goes my light, would be almost, I think, impossible. I don't know. Maybe I don't know the writing world enough, but it feels like that's a very rich level of contribution. And the fact that it's a person who's like closest to you in the world feels like such a, such a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it takes enormous kind of levels of trust to do what we do. I mean, it's, we, we can get really angry at each other. You know, like you can imagine like I'll spend mm. 50 hours on something and she'll say, math, I don't, you know, this isn't good, you know, and then I'll be like, oh, you know, but she, she, usually there's been a few times when she's been wrong and it's actually good and I just have to reframe, but usually she's right. It, it's, it's, this is always the time. But, but it, it's taken us maybe a decade to kind of develop. We did it, we were not this brutal when we started out. I know it's probably not a good idea to be this brutal when you start out, but like, it's really valuable to try to build that kind of level of trust where you can be really, really honest and brutal because, because that, that, there is that kind of like nice way of doing it that people do it where they say nice things. Oh, that was, an, you know. That leaves so much value on the table and yeah, working up, I've, I've had similar relationships with maybe one or two other editors and it, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly valuable to have that kind of brutality 
But where yeah. do you find that without like an editor? I mean, I, I don't know. For me, I send my, my, my drafts to my friends who, you know, one of which is my, my friend that, that referenced or that pointed me in your direction. And he's a really good writer and reader. Well, he reads a lot of contents himself, so he knows he's got a sense for quality. But I can't send every essay to him because he's got a full-time job. I mean, <laughs> where, like, are there people that you can pay or I don't know, what's the... Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I am very privileged. Oh, first of all, of, of, I, I don't send everything to my wife because her time okay. is precious. I only send essays where I feel like this could really go somewhere because she spends a lot of time, like enormous amount of time doing it. Uh, so, so I can't do every essay with her because mm-hmm. then we can't take care of our kids. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, I mean, and I'm privileged that I have many readers now, and I've met many people. So I have maybe I don't know thirty or forty people that I send to. So, so depending on the topic, like I have friends who are really into education, and and then I I'll send to them when I've write up on those topics, and then I have friends who are really into AI, I'll send to them. So. I've just kind of snowballed and collected interesting people by, by writing and like engaging. And, and that's also an important part of like me giving back and me helping people. And it might not be that I, it's a mutual thing. It might not be that I help person A and that person A helps me back. It mm-hmm. might just, we're in a similar community. So I help person A and person B sees that I'm goodwill and then they help me, right? But but it's it's really hard when you're starting out to get that kind of snowball going and find those people. I know for a while that Less Wrong had editors who worked for them so that if you had enough karma in their forum that you'd like proven that you were like a serious contributor to their community, you would get access to an editor. And I used that early on, worked with them maybe four or five times. So, so there are some kind of hidden things like that. I'm not sure if that's, that's active anymore, but. But there are some some pro social things like that. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, I just gleaned from something that you wrote that you also like have contributed a lot in like on, the online forum space, which is I think you know something which I've never actually participated in. I don't know. Maybe I'm like on some other back end of the internet where I haven't like you know been on Reddit. Like I've, I've I only have started browsing Reddit recently, <laughs> and apparently uh, this is something where you can learn. Yeah. About. I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's still a lot of interesting places like that and Discord and so on. I'm not super active in that world now. I simply don't have the time. Mm. But, but yeah, as a teenager, that was really important to find these kind of internet forums. I think it was even better back then in a way because there was no social media. Like it, that whole, it was, it was, I think the way I'm doing it, I'm, I'm like, or the way I'm hoping that I'm doing it, like in this very kind of pro-social way and it's. That, that seemed like a norm back then. Like it, and now it feels a bit odd, you know, like everyone is like building a brand and being content creators and, and stuff like that. It's, it's very kind of zero sum in a way these days, uh, most of it. And it, it didn't feel like that because, you know, no one had faces, you know, everyone had set names and there was no way to make money or build a brand or anything. And, and there were no big platforms. So you were always like in a small platform, there was only like 200 people there. And then you'd go to another platform and, that was not the same people. So you couldn't build like a, a brand or anything. So you, that just created a different dynamic back then. I think you can find that like in Discord servers and stuff now. I've done a bit of that, but but yeah, don't have time now. Yeah. Well, I mean, on that point, we're like five minutes from the end of the call. So I, I want to sort of tie a little bow on that part and stop recording. So thank you for your time. If you've watched to the end, thank you so much for your time and attention. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you thought about the format and potentially should I turn this into a podcast? Well, this episode. Also, a massive thanks to Henrik for making the time available for this discussion. If you want to support Henrik, have a look at his blog, Escaping Flatland. It really has been a worthwhile subscription for me and it's rare to find someone doing such good work and living such an intentional life. Thanks so much.